Created by Trey Parker and Matt Stone in the early 90s, South Park has become infamous for its surreal and satirical subject matter. Well, that and it's absolutely hilarious. And today we're taking a very special look at all things South Park and its many exploits, not to mention controversies. But to kickstart things, here's a look at the top characters who inhabit the series. Ah, hell. I guess we better go look for it. Dad, we gotta cut it short. Fire up the 1220! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 best South Park characters. Don't look at him, just look straight ahead and he'll run out of energy soon. <laughs> for this list, we'll be looking at our favorite main and supporting characters from this legendary animated comedy. Do you have a favorite South Park character? Number 20. Officer Bar Brady Given all of the insane things that have happened in the town of South Park, you'd think they would have a decent police force. Okay, people, listen up. If Officer Bar Brady is any indication, it's no wonder things get so bad. Introduced all the way back in Season 1, we've watched this incompetent police chief fumble in his attempts to maintain any kind of law and order in the town. He's been fired more than once and has been mocked repeatedly by the four boys. Although his appearances have slipped since the introduction of Sergeant Yates, he's still around, reminding us that sometimes the kids are more mature than adults. Well, anyway, I'm relieving you of your duties. I've proved that I can read, and now I'm back on the job! Hooray! Number 19. Shelly Marsh as the older sister to Stan, Shelly has been tormenting her little brother for as long as he can remember. Are you looking at my headgear? Headgear? What headgear? Are you looking at my headgear? Oh, gosh, I, I didn't really notice. You little liar. No, I think it looks terrific. It matches your... Ah! She seems to be in a perpetual state of discontent, as we often find her yelling at her parents and referring to everyone around her as turds. What number are you, turd? Despite her belligerent attitude towards everyone, we have managed to catch a few glimpses of a real girl underneath her headgear. She develops a bit of a friendship with Cartman in Season 3 and finds herself in love a handful of times over the years. She may be the bane of Stan's existence, but we do love seeing these two on screen from time to time. Number 18. The Goth Kids Introduced in the Season 7 episode Raisins, we learn that the town has their own goth clique. Always dressed in black, these four can be seen smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and depressing everyone around them. I don't drink coffee. You can't be a nonconformist if you don't drink coffee. Forever talking about how pointless life is, they refer to average citizens as conformists who follow what society expects of them. As gloomy as they are, Stan's temporary participation in their group yielded an episode that highlighted both the highs and lows of our everyday life. The goth kids may be Debbie Downers, but sometimes we all have our lows. Look at that. Another tortured soul. Another life of pain. Number 17. Towley. Yogurt himself said it best. Merchandising! Merchandising! Indeed, that's where the real money is made. In response to aspects of a show created solely for the purpose of selling merchandise, Trey Parker and Matt Stone gave us Towley. That's why Towley says, don't forget to bring a towel. A literal two-dimensional being who originally just spouted catchphrases and annoyed everyone. He was intentionally written to be a terrible character and became a fan favorite for that very reason. Forever obsessed with getting high, Towley found himself in trouble with the law several times before finding his own place. Given his propensity for illicit substances, it only seemed natural for him to eventually end up helping Randy with his weed business. Number 16. Tweak Tweak If Tweak had more of a sense of humor, he might have been referred to as the Robin Williams of South Park. Forever twitching and vibrating, Tweak is a high-strung child who never seems to have a moment's peace. Tweak, do you have any ideas? Ugh, too much pressure! Introduced in the memorable Gnomes episode, this poor kid's anxiety level is so high, nothing around him is beyond suspect. Coming from a family of coffee drinkers, Tweak's consistent diet of the caffeinated beverage seems to be the root of his jitters. It also doesn't help that the drink he's so obsessed with consuming is also laced with meth. 
We do, however, love the fact that he became the spasmic half of the show's first young gay couple. Maybe we should go away, put cares aside for just a day. Number 15. Tolkien, Token Black. One thing South Park does not do is subtlety. While his real name was only recently revealed to be Tolkien, as in the Lord of the Rings author, I thought your name was Tolkien. My name is Tolkien. I'm sorry, I don't think it's that weird. J.R. Tolkien is one of the most prolific, influential writers of our time. The name Tolkien pokes fun at how often television inserts a person of color into their programming, all in the name of diversity. How many times do we have to go through this? You're black, you can play bass. I'm getting sick of your stereotypes. Be as sick as you want, just give me a goddamn bass line! God damn it. His origins may have been purely satirical, but the fourth grader has become a notable character throughout the years. Countless spats with Cartman have given audiences plenty of laughs, while Randy's Wheel of Fortune incident allowed Stan and Tolkien to talk about a subject no one ever wants to discuss. He may have started off as a one-off ethnical punchline, but Tolkien has grown to become as much part of the South Park gang as anyone on this list. Now you get it, Stan. Number 14. PC Principal Peter Charles replaced Principal Victoria at South Park Elementary during the season 19 premiere. All right, listen up. My name is PC Principal. I don't know about you, but frankly, I'm sick and tired of how minority groups are marginalized in today's society. I'm here because this place is lost in a time warp. Nicknamed PC Principal, Charles is the personification of the extremes political correctness can be taken to. Given how anti-PC the show's creators tend to be, we love the idea of a character that serves as the antithesis to that. His aggressive and punitive stance on the subject only amplifies the absurdity of the whole thing. It only gets better when we learn of his participation in the PC Delta fraternity. What does being PC really mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means you love nothing more than beer, working out, and that feeling you get when you rhetorically defend a marginalized community from systems of oppression. <laughs> the sheer contrast of frat life versus political correctness is pure comedic genius, and PC Principal is at the center of it. Number 13. Satan Considered to be the root of all evil in our world, in the realm of South Park, Satan is one of the most conflicted characters the show has given us. Puny son of Jehovah, prepare to enter thy house of pain. Yes, he did try to take over the world a few times, and sure, he did fake a knockout in a boxing match with Jesus, but he also gave us a memorable music number, and even saved mankind from annihilation. The South Park movie showed us a Satan who was vulnerable, sensitive, and just trying to find love. Sometimes I think, when I look up real high, that there's such a big world up there, I'd like to give it a try. He's yet another example of how this show gives us the opposite of what audiences expect. Plus, who knew Satan could throw such a great Halloween party? Number 12. Terrence and Philip. It's hard to fathom it now, but at one time, South Park was criticized for being a poorly animated show about nothing but fart jokes. So, sure enough, this show within a show was created to illustrate exactly what that would really look like. What garbage? Well, what do you expect? They're Canadian. Terrence and Philip became a reflection of the show's skewed perception while easily giving a middle finger to those who didn't get the joke. The Canadian duo were a major part of South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, and have resurfaced occasionally. With the toilet humor accusations now long behind them, Terrence and Philip remain a staple of the show's longtime Canadian mythology. You can't let Canada Channel be soiled by that perverse garbage! You know it's sick! Number 11. Wendy Testaburger. From the onset of this show, it seems like Wendy Testaburger was going to be nothing more than a target for Stan's projectile vomiting affections. Hi, guys. Hi, Wendy. Here, Stan. This is for you. Block you! Bye, Wendy. But as the show's main female character, Wendy has gone on to become far more than Stan's girlfriend. She's not afraid to speak her mind and stand up for whatever cause she's backing. She's also one of the most mature people in the town, 
even in comparison to most of the adults. An estimated one in six women will deal with cancer in their lifetime, and breast cancer is the most common. <laughs> she said it again. However, even with that, we do have to admit we loved seeing her give Cartman a run for his money on the playground. Number 10. Jerome Chef McElroy during the first nine seasons of South Park, Chef was the one adult figure in the lives of the kids. Hello there, children. Hey, Chef. We consistently saw him dole out far better advice to the children than any parent or teacher. Forever the ladies' man, he was known for breaking into wholly inappropriate songs as he tried to steer the kids away from whatever new catastrophe was waiting for them. We're all special in our own way. Everybody's different, but that's okay. Cause even though we might have different color skin, different points of views be tall or thin, it doesn't mean I can't lay you down, woman, and touch your silky skin. He was infamously killed off at the start of season 10, following a statement reportedly made on Isaac Hayes' behalf by his Scientology entourage after Hayes suffered a stroke, which requested the voice of Chef be released from the show. Having now been absent for more than half the show's run, he's still a character that remains prominent in the minds of fans. Number 9. Mr. Mackey He told the kids that drugs were bad, okay? Smoking's bad, you shouldn't smoke. And uh, alcohol is bad, you shouldn't drink alcohol. And uh, as for drugs, well, drugs are bad. You shouldn't do drugs. He sang a memorable song about the use of profanity in the South Park movie. He even overcame a childhood trauma by sharing a dream with Stan. But above all else, Mr. Mackey has done his best to try and help the kids in his school. His methods and his behavior have not always gone over so well, but his memorable mm ks and simplified view of the world have given audiences plenty of laughs. He's made even better when we learn his tone and signature sign-off was inspired by Trey Parker's real-life school guidance counselor. Art really does imitate life. You can do it, it's all up to you, okay? With a little plan, you can change your life today. Number 8. Jimmy Vollmer With the introduction of both Jimmy and Timmy, South Park added a couple of great characters with physical disabilities to its roster. Timmy, put on this silly hat. Just for a second, Timmy. Don't be a jerk, Timmy. Hey, don't push me! The former originally started as nothing more than a rival for Timmy. However, the fourth grader really came into his own as the series went on. In spite of having cerebral palsy, Jimmy's personality has made him a recurring comedic icon in South Park. Wow, what a great audience! I just flew into South Park. Boy, are my crutches tired. <laughs> What a terrific audience. He often comes up with the dirtiest jokes. He's oddly charismatic and is probably second only to Cartman when it comes to the list of crimes he's committed. Keep it classy, Jimmy. Just as B B Bush predicted, Baghdad fell, Iraq fell, Saddam fell. The only thing that didn't fall, the price of gas. Number 7. Garrison South Park Elementary is home to a whole slew of diverse teachers. However, the one who has ultimately gone through the most changes is Garrison. This fourth grade teacher appeared during the first season of South Park and is still a part of it today. Initially quite repressed, the character would go on to explore issues like sexuality throughout the show, as well as get into politics. You don't love me! <laughs> After turning into someone that shared quite a few parallels with the real-life Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States went back to teaching. We certainly can say that Garrison has had an interesting career. The Canadians can't do this! Don't they realize that hundreds of thousands of their people are over here illegally? Number 6. Kyle Bruflosky He may not be as adorable as his younger brother Ike, but Kyle has certainly been a mainstay since the show's origins. Kick the baby! Don't kick the baby. The resident Jewish kid of the group, he has often been the voice of reason when it hits the fan throughout the years. Not that it does him much good. As the sometime friend, sometime nemesis to Cartman, the two often find themselves in heated exchanges whenever the latter is up to no good. Cartman, do you even know what's going on? While he's ultimately a good boy with a strong head on his shoulders, he still tends to be emotionally impulsive. 
As a result, he often finds himself in all kinds of awkward situations like Imagination Land and the Human Sentai Pad. Number 5. Kenny McCormick Poor, poor Kenny. While things may have changed later on in the series, this muffled member of South Park's most famous quartet is most well known for one thing and one thing only, dying in every single episode. As a result, he's been crushed, shot, decapitated, killed by celebrities, killed by having his heart replaced with a baked potato, and the list goes on and on. We accidentally replaced your heart with a baked potato. You have about three seconds to live. While he and the Grim Reaper started to have a bit of a break as of season six, he's more than proven his worth in the realm of the living thanks to an awesome Batman impression. What is your power? I can't die. Number 4. Stan Marsh No, I, I don't really care about the TV show. I'm just trying to stop the Japanese from killing dolphins and whales. Like Kyle, Stan stands out as one of the few reasonable kids in South Park. As such, he's often challenged by the likes of Cartman and whatever wave of crazy hits the town that week. One could call him the most emotionally complex of the group, especially when it comes to serious social issues like whaling. Above all else, however, he's just a boy in love. It's just unfortunate he can't get lovey-dovey with his girlfriend Wendy without projectile vomiting all over her. But hey, at least he's great at jacking it in San Diego. I'm gonna go out jacking it in San Diego. Jacking it, jacking it, jacking it, jack. Spanking it, jacking it, spanking it, smack. Number three. Butter Stotch. The only way I can feel this right now is if I felt something really good before. So I have to take the bad with the good. Speaking of sensitive, here's a fan favorite who's become a central character. Butters is probably the nicest kid you could ever hope to meet. With a big heart, bigger imagination, and overwhelming desire to help people, it's that very nature that's led him to be manipulated by the likes of Cartman and the rest on frequent occasions. Oh, my parents don't know, but sometimes I get picked on by this one kid at school. His name is Eric Cartman, and he always tries to play jokes on me and stuff. Uh, really? It hasn't stopped him from trying to look on the sunny side of things, however. Hell, he's so nice that he managed to become the most well-regarded pimp in South Park. You should be doing kisses on the playground. You can make 50 bucks a day. Buy all the purses and shoes you've ever worn. I'll treat you right. Number two, Randy Marsh. Excuse me, I need to, uh, have some private internet time. Look, we're just trying to get by here. Everyone's got to take what they can get. I haven't jacked off in over two weeks. We can say without a shadow of a doubt, there has never been a father quite like Randy. While it's easy to see that above all else, he loves his family and strives to be a role model for Stan, he has accumulated quite the list of accomplishments over the series' run, all of which are of a questionable nature. He purposefully got himself testicular cancer, he forced a Virgin Mary statue to bleed on him, he has the world record for the largest crap, and he has a secret life as the singer Lord. Again, there's no dad quite like Randy. Number 1. Eric Cartman He's rude, he's racist, he's foul-mouthed, he's sexist, He's vengeful, he's easily offended, he's selfish, he's a coward, and he's a liar. Okay, I'm sorry I handcuffed Billy Turner's ankle to a flagpole and then gave him a hacksaw. And then told him I had poisoned his lunch milk and that the only way he could get to the antidote in time would be to saw through his leg. That's very naughty, Eric. Undoubtedly, this little boy from a little mountain town in Colorado might just be the most despicable character ever conceived. Yet, we can't bring ourselves to hate him. Cartman is so outrageous in his schemes and antics that he more often than not ends up making us laugh the most, even when he does horrendous things like turning a guy's parents into chili. Besides, it's not like he doesn't get his comeuppance every now and again. That's right! You and me! Right now! We're having it out! Let's go! Come on! Come on! <laughs> if there's one thing for sure about South Park, is that it never plays it safe. And we wouldn't want it any other way. But has it crossed the line? Eh, you be the judge. Sweetie, really, don't go there, okay? Oh, I went there. 
I went there, took some pictures, and flew back already. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 South Park jokes that cross the line. Dude, that's not cool. You should make fun of Christopher Reeve. Yeah, dude, not cool. For this list, we're taking a look at instances where South Park got especially controversial and offensive, even to the point that it shocked longtime fans of the show. Which South Park joke made you think, okay, they've gone too far this time? Number 20. Kyle Kills Jesus In Fantastic Easter Special, Jesus and Kyle find themselves being held prisoner by the Catholic League. In order to escape the cell that they are being held in, Jesus must use his powers. But unable to use them as a mortal, Jesus realizes the only way he can reobtain them is by dying. He asks for Kyle's assistance, who naturally has some reservations. Dude, you don't understand. I, I'm a Jew. I have a few hang-ups about killing Jesus. However, he follows through with the request, and the aftermath is gruesome to say the least. The writers clearly knew what they were doing here. Fortunately, he is actually resurrected and is able to save the day. Jesus? Number 19. Garrison's Relationship with Garrison Sr. In Worldwide Recorder Concert, Garrison is shown to have a complicated father-child relationship. Based on how Garrison behaves, viewers are led to believe Garrison Sr. mistreated Garrison. But that is not at all the case. In fact, it's actually quite the opposite. In a shocking twist, the issue stems from the fact that he never actually did anything to Garrison in the first place, and this results in Garrison believing that Garrison Sr. had no love for his child. What? Was it that I was ugly? Oh my god! I wasn't good enough for you, was that it, Dad? Well no! Thus, the episode sees Garrison pressuring Garrison Sr. into assault to prove his love. We can only gasp and be in shock at this strange twist of reverse psychology. You stood by and let it happen. You saw him come home drunk and then just go right to sleep. I'm not listening! Face it, mother, he never abused me! Number 18. Woodland Critter Christmas Leave it to Trey Parker and Matt Stone to add in an absolutely insane plot twist. In arguably the show's most shocking Christmas special, what starts out as a simple tale with Stan helping out a few cute-looking critters takes on a very, very dark turn. Now our Critter Christmas can finally happen! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Wait, what, what? Much to his horror, Stan soon realizes that these critters are not who they say they are and have very dark intentions. Rejoicing at no longer having to deal with the mountain lion that frequently foiled their plans, they celebrate in utterly vile fashion. It's too much for even those with the utmost tolerance. Number 17. Sex Education Season 5's Proper Condom Use centers on sex education. At South Park Elementary, teachers attempt to educate the children about sex and, as anticipated, fail tremendously. One such instance where we see their shortcomings firsthand is when Garrison is shown educating kindergartners about condoms and how to put them on. How does Garrison do this, you might ask? With a full-on demonstration involving the mouth. The children are traumatized, and, well, we can't blame them. The time is drawing close for delivery. Here we can see the water breaking. Ew! The episode itself sparked so much controversy that it was banned in the United Kingdom, and the country of Australia even increased the episode's rating. Number 16. The Miss Crabtree Stunt it's no secret that Kenny is very much into performing crazy stunts, but when he's unable to perform his most dangerous one yet in Season 4's Fat Camp due to a run-in with Howard Stern, Stan and Kyle force a boy posing as Cartman to go through with it instead. But this isn't fair! Deal, druggy. <laughs> Dressed as Kenny, the boy does what the real Kenny was supposed to do, insert himself inside Miss Crabtree's uterus and remain inside there for six hours on live television. Naturally, things don't end well for the poor boy, and he, unfortunately, doesn't live to tell the tale. We understand the creator's intent to parody the show Jackass, but this was just too much. Number 15. Bloody Mary 
The town of South Park was in complete pandemonium when a statue of the Virgin Mary began shooting blood from its behind. People from all over the state have flocked here to the church to witness the apparent miracle firsthand. Randy and other townspeople begin to believe this is a miracle, and that coming into contact with a statue means there's a chance that it could cure their diseases. However, upon further inspection, it is not revealed to be a miracle, since the blood is in fact actually coming from another part of the female anatomy. While Christians likely weren't too pleased with the matter at which the Virgin Mary was depicted, the mere sight of a statue shooting blood at people wasn't a comforting sight to see. I'm not going to drink this. I'm not going to drink this! It's a miracle! I'm cured! Number 14. Randy starts COVID-19. Does it matter what started coronavirus? Who cares what started coronavirus? You guys are being racist! Are we really all that surprised? Out of all the characters on South Park, if anybody were to start a worldwide pandemic, it'd most definitely be Randy. Upon hearing a news report that the COVID-19 pandemic started as a result of someone being contaminated by a bat in Wuhan, he begins to connect the dots. A bat in Wuhan? He remembers how, during a night on the town in China with Mickey Mouse, he had sexual relations with a bat. On top of that, when the source of COVID is later revealed to in fact be a pangolin, Randy remembers that he and Mickey also had sexual relations with it. This and the fact that viewers see Randy and everyone's favorite mouse actually getting it on with animals is shocking to say the least. Number 13. Interorectogestion In the episode Red Hot Catholic Love, Carmen bizarrely comes up with an outrageous hypothesis in that if one puts food up their rectum, they shall defecate through their mouth. Carmen, that's the dumbest thing you've ever said. The other boys find this outrageous, but when it actually ends up working, everyone is in utter disbelief. Yes! Yes, I did it! I crapped out my mouth! I crapped out my mouth! News spreads of the phenomenon, and it isn't long before the citizens of South Park begin doing it too. We see what the writers are trying to do here, but it's, well, how could we put it? Really disgusting? The amount of times we see people literally spew crap becomes almost excessive, and it is clearly over-exaggerated. Fortunately, the townspeople eventually decide on ending the practice. Number 12. Mr. Slave vs. Paris Hilton It's the showdown of the century, as Paris Hilton and Mr. Slave go head-to-head -to, -head to see who is the biggest floozy of them all. Paris starts things off when she not only makes out with the event MC, but then lewdly dances with several random males. She ends it off by doing something that we can only describe as way, way over the top with a pineapple. When it's time for Mr. Slave to prove his worth, he does so by absorbing Miss Hilton. No one anticipated for this to be the way in which Mr. Slave would get one over this celebrity. And the only thing more surprising than that is the fact that she survives the whole ordeal. Let me out of here! Number 11. Steve Irwin at his Halloween party, it is brought to Satan's attention that someone has dressed up as Steve Irwin, and it's upsetting the guests. Oh, jeez. Satan confronts the individual, but he soon realizes that they are, in fact, Steve Irwin. To say that the encounter becomes awkward is an understatement, but Satan quickly kicks him out of the party because he wasn't wearing a costume. Oh, but then, dude, no costume. Everything about this joke feels completely wrong. From the way in which Irwin is depicted, the fact that he's in hell, or even him mentioning that he thought both he and Satan were friends. It all feels very distasteful. Number 10. Cuttlefish and Asparagus I give you the human centipede! The Human Centipede has gained a reputation as one of the most repulsive films ever made. Naturally, South Park simply couldn't resist parodying the infamous horror film. Steve Jobs assumes the role of the Mad Doctor, sewing three Apple users together from mouth to anus. 
Looks good, guys. Great work. Unfortunately for Kyle, he's the one who ends up in the middle of Jobs' human sentai pad. While the whole setup is cringeworthy, the scene that really got under people's skin involved an Asian man digesting cuttlefish and asparagus into Kyle's mouth. As disgusting as the episode might be, at least it didn't go full sequence on us. Number 9. Chef's Demise You guys! You guys! Chef is going away. Going away? For how long? Forever. In Season 9, South Park flirted with controversy with its mockery of Scientology. You don't actually believe this crap, do you? But for many people, it was the aftermath in Season 10 that truly crossed the line. Isaac Hayes' Scientology entourage made a statement that was reportedly on his behalf requesting he be released from the show. In response, the creators used pre-recorded dialogue to portray Chef as a deviant that's been brainwashed. The kicker comes when Chef falls down a cliff, is impaled, gets attacked by wild animals, and defecates. Watching poor Chef go in the most demeaning way possible, audiences couldn't help but shout, Number 8. Britney Spears 2008 was just not Britney Spears' best year, and South Park was there to take advantage. The boys accidentally pushed Britney to her limits, influencing the pop princess to put a shotgun in her mouth. Although the top of her head is blown off, Britney amazingly doesn't die. Even after this suicide attempt, people continue to mock her appearance and behavior. The episode's relentlessness left the audience feeling uncomfortable throughout. To the creator's credit, however, they did make some thoughtful commentary on how the media and public had been treating the singer, influencing them to just leave Britney alone already. I think it's time for us to leave the poor girl alone. Number 7. Cartman's Revenge by the fifth season, Eric Cartman had already proven himself as South Park's resident bad boy. In this episode, though, he went from being a problem child to a flat-out psychopath. As a petty feud with older student Scott Tennerman escalates, Cartman gets his revenge by arranging to have his rival's parents murdered. It doesn't end there, as he grinds up their bodies and feeds them to the unsuspecting Scott. Do you like it? Do you like it, Scott? I call it... Mr. and Mrs. Tenerman Chili. Oh my god! Oh my god! On one hand, the episode boldly pushed boundaries. On the other, we can definitely see why this downright mean-spirited ending left so many people saying, that's too much. Yes! Oh, let me taste your tears, Scott. Mm, your tears are so yummy and sweet. Dude, I think it might be best for us to never piss Cartman off again. Good call. Number 6. HIV Positive South Park has never shied away from poking fun at AIDS, but that didn't make this episode any less outrageous. It all begins when a surgery gone wrong results in Cartman contracting HIV. During the tonsil surgery, we had to supply you with donor blood. A mistake was made and you were given blood contaminated with HIV. It was a one in a billion fluke. I have AIDS? Kyle views this as karmic, which influences Cartman to pass on the deadly disease on to him. With some help from Magic Johnson, the two eventually find a cure for the virus. Cash and lots of it. Sadly, not everyone has $180,000 just lying around. Kyle's outburst at Cartman towards the episode's conclusion sums up why AIDS isn't funny. Nevertheless, Cartman still tries to put an HIV-positive spin on things. You boys both have the virus, are you sure? We're not just sure, we're HIV-positive. Number 5. Lemmy Winks Holy moly, I've gotta find a way to get fired for being gay! Learning that the school can be sued if Garrison's fired for being gay, the teacher basically turns the classroom into a sex dungeon. Determined to shock the students, Garrison hatches a plan that involves a gerbil, a Bunsen burner, and Mr. Slave's butt. Lemmawink soon discovers that he's not the only animal that's been shoved up Slave's rectum, leading to one vile adventure. 
While Matt Stone and Trey Parker found this hilarious, most of their colleagues just thought it was bizarre and would never make it into the finished product. Even to the duo's friends, the episode was as messed up as it was funny. Number 4. Ghost Ectoplasm a world without internet means no Brazilian adult entertainment, leaving Randy unable to pleasure himself. Upon getting back online, Randy is finally allowed to unleash weeks of pent-up frustration. Oh, finally, I'm online again! But his moans attract unrequested attention and mass vomiting. Randy tries to pass off the white substance covering his body as ectoplasm, but the Ghostbusters reference doesn't get him anywhere. After this scene was aired, Trey Parker stated that it was probably the most offensive shot in the show's history and couldn't believe the censors let it slide by. It's really saying something when the co-creator of South Park admits the show crossed a line. Number 3. Muhammad South Park has gotten away with a lot, but the censors draw the line when it comes to portraying the prophet Muhammad. Still, Muhammad actually was depicted in Season 5 alongside Jesus, Buddha, and other religious figures. But when the creators later tried showing Muhammad in a Season 10 two-parter, Comedy Central wouldn't have it. You mean like the time you had tea with Muhammad, the prophet of the Muslim faith? Come on, Muhammad, let's get some tea! They challenged censorship once again in the 200th episode, as the boys attempted to unveil Muhammad to Tom Cruise. In due course, Stone and Parker received a death threat from a radical Muslim group. Muhammad's name was subsequently censored in the 201st episode, along with the episode's message. Number 2. Christopher Reeve and Stem Cells As most of you know, I am a strong supporter of stem cell research. Following the accident that paralyzed him, Christopher Reeve became an advocate for stem cell research, which gave Matt and Trey a jaw-dropping idea. Audiences couldn't believe their eyes when Reeve was depicted sucking fetuses dry. The stem cells eventually turned Reeve into a supervillain, his arch-nemesis, of course, being Gene Hackman. You won't stop me, Hackman! Knowing that it would be in poor taste, the creators initially held back on satirizing Reeve, but decided to go for it after seeing his Larry King Live interview. Even then, they knew the joke would only get by if virtually every character acknowledged that this really wasn't cool. And it wasn't. Number 1. Indiana Jones when Stan and Kyle mentioned that one of their friends was assaulted, audiences knew that South Park was about to cross the line like never before. Of course, nobody could have predicted that the friend in question was Indiana Jones, who was terribly mistreated by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. We see Jones suffer at the hands of both filmmakers multiple times throughout the episode, with each instance being more graphic than the last. No, what are you gonna do to him? While there is some pretty clever satire here, this incredibly dark imagery had a lot of people feeling grossed out, disturbed, and uncertain if they should be laughing. Was Kingdom of the Crystal Skull really that bad? I thought it was pretty good. Okay, sticking with South Park being offensive, our next video highlights some of the show's most off-putting musical numbers. Who knew a song could ruffle so many feathers? Because when they said that this was the land of the free, I'm pretty sure that they were referring to me. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 most offensive South Park songs. And so every December I go to the Middle East and fly. For this list, we'll be looking at pieces of music from South Park whose lyrics have the potential to upset viewers. The songs in question are either from the show or movie. Did any of these songs offend you? Number 10. I'm Not the Poorest Kid in School Cartman is an awful person, and he takes great joy in tormenting students who are less fortunate than him. Cartman is taken away from his mother and placed in a new school, where he learns of a poor kid named Jacob Hallery. This joyous discovery results in him singing, I'm Not the Poorest Kid in School. Greeny, Colorado's the place to be. It's a whole new beginning for you and me. 
Life can only get better cause I know one simple reason And that he's not the pocket is key The shallowness and singing continue But this time they're geared towards Kenny when he returns to South Park Elementary Cause I'm not, he's not, he's not the pocket is key Cartman isn't providing aid or sympathy to Jacob or Kenny Rather, he's borderline mocking their destitution And showing pride in his greater economic standing Number 9. Kyle's Mom's an Expletive Whee! First appearing in the episode Mr. Hanky the Christmas Pooh, Kyle's Mom's a expletive pushed the boundaries of television. The song's lyrics are incredibly inappropriate, featuring dozens of uses of the titular word. In fact, it's estimated that the word is used just under once per second. Both the constant swearing and the derogatory term itself could be considered offensive. The boundaries were pushed even further when the song was reused for South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. Don't say it, Cartman! Wait. Don't do it, Cartman! Wait. Even more offensive words were introduced, including F-bombs and some anti-Semitic discourse. One thing's for sure, Kyle's mom wasn't happy hearing these lyrics. Number 8. A Chorus of Wieners Game of Thrones was all the rage when South Park's trilogy of episodes parodying the HBO hit was released in 2013. But this scene doesn't parody specific scenes or characters, rather it parodies the theme song. In the style of the show's iconic intro, a well-dressed choir sings a rather inappropriate song about a rather inappropriate subject. A chorus of wieners continuously repeats the titular slang word, and the climax of the song goes to some surprisingly graphic places. Stop! Stop, please! I can't take any more! George R.R. R. Martin even responded to the episode's depiction of him, proclaiming that he is not in fact obsessed with, well, you know. Number 7. California Loves the Homeless Let's hope to crash this works. The 11th season episode, Knights of the Living Homeless, parodies zombie movies and portrays the titular group as brain-dead individuals begging for change. It's a satire on how unhoused people are negatively perceived, and this satire is on full display in California Loves the Homeless. Not In a parody of California Love, Cartman and the boys try to rid South Park of its homeless population by promoting the virtues of California. While it is satire, the negative depiction of unhoused individuals may prove offensive to some, as could the callous way that the boys dispose of them. Number 6. Where Has My Country Gone? Garrison has never been shy to express a dislike for immigrants, and this is on full display in Season 19's Where My Country Gone. In the song of the nearly same name, Garrison sings about hating Canadian immigrants and how they're supposedly destroying the US. Again, like most things on South Park, this tune is meant as a biting piece of satire. Where's my country gown? It was just here like two seconds ago. But when taken out of context, where has my country gone could prove wickedly offensive. Country gone! Please tell it that we need her back home. The general theme of the song is unpleasant, and it uses scathing and racist language to make its nasty point. Where is my country Number 5. Vote or Die Vote or Die? What the hell does that even mean? What do you think it means? During the 2004 presidential election, P. Diddy, Mary J. Blige, Mariah Carey, and 50 Cent started a service group called Citizen Change. This very public group encouraged the young and marginalized demographics to cast their rightful ballots. The campaign's somewhat bizarre slogan was Vote or Die, which was parodied in this song of the same name. Democracy is founded on one simple rule. 
It's a rather violent piece of music that directly targets the listener with foul language and antagonistic statements. There is a good amount of crassness on display, as P. Diddy uses sexist and derogatory language to address his female listeners. Vote or die. Vote or die. Okay, I'll vote. Number four, work Mexican work. The Last of the Mexicans touches on some rather touchy subjects, including illegal immigration at the Mexican border. This is especially touched on in the episode's subplot involving Cartman, which sees him as a very zealous agent of the United States Border Patrol. The episode features the song Work Mexican Work, which perpetuates harmful stereotypes about Mexican-American individuals and blue-collar labor. The term Mexican work is offensive enough, but the song goes to even further depths. All in all, it's a very disparaging song that is wildly insensitive to certain communities. Number 3. What Really Happened on 9-11 September 11th, 2001 is a day that will live in infamy, and many people take the topic very seriously. It's a delicate subject, and the myriad of conspiracy theories that surround it can cause offense. I can't just blindly accept their version. I can't base my logic on proof. Unsurprisingly, Cartman is a non-believer and sings a song titled What Really Happened on 9-11. The joke is on Cartman, as it often is, portraying him as a buffoon with biased and unsound reasoning. But the subject of the song, that of a conspiracy theorist hoping to uncover the elusive truth of 9-11, is objectionable at best, insulting at worst. Of course. It's so obvious. How did we not see it before? Number 2. Merry Expletive Christmas Garrison strikes again with this disrespectful song in Mr. Hankey's Christmas Classics. This episode is filled with beloved seasonal tunes, including O oh Holy Night and Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. And then there's Garrison's contribution, which offends many different cultures and ethnic groups around the world. The teacher takes aim at various countries for not celebrating Christmas and goes to some extreme language lengths. Hurtful terms are thrown around, and Garrison insults many aspects of certain lifestyles. Something tells us this won't become an annual mainstay on the radio. Thank you, Mr. Hand. Number 1. Not My Water Park This song bears a few similarities to Garrison's Where Has My Country Gone, as it also focuses on bigoted xenophobia. Only this time, it comes from Cartman. Not My Water Park sees the white child lamenting the Asian, Black, Hispanic, and Native American families that are visiting a water park. Once again, the joke is on Cartman, as his words aren't meant to be taken seriously. There are too many But the song itself is unbelievably offensive, with racist and discriminatory language galore. In a rare turn, the song generated mixed responses, with some finding it a little too offensive. It was also argued that the song tipped from satire into just genuine racism. God, I'm asking, please, get all of these minorities out of my water pot. Let's face it, South Park thrives on the dissemination of the world at large, and that includes many of the prominent people at the forefront. But have you ever wondered what their reactions are to getting the South Park parody treatment? Well, wonder no more. Oh, I am such a huge fan, Miss Streisand! I never thought I'd live to see you in person! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 celebrity reactions to South Park parodies. Oh, I would never say anything. I saw some show where they made fun of Sally Struthers' weight, and I thought it was totally cruel. I mean, she helps people, you know? For this list, we'll be looking at famous celebrities depicted on South Park and what their real-life counterparts thought of their portrayal. Do you have a favorite celebrity appearance on South Park? Number 20. Nicole Snooki Laval. 
When Jersey Shore first hit the airwaves, fans couldn't get enough of the antics, the catfights, and promiscuous behavior of the show's star, Nicole Snooky Polizzi. They're like so rude sometimes, like the way they say things. I'm not used to like people being so rude like that. It's kind of offensive. It didn't take long before South Park dedicated an entire episode to poking fun at the ever-expanding world that was the Jersey Shore. One notable gag was their portrayal of Snooki as some type of carnal animal that attacked anyone who came near her. What is it? It's called a Snooki. It's very famous. The day after the episode aired, the real Snooki took to Twitter and quoted her South Park counterpart in saying, Snooki wants smush mush. We've officially made it. Clearly laughing at herself, it's a far better reaction than some of the others on this list. Why are you people doing this? But I told you, it's just a Jersey thing. Number 19, Robert Smith. So this one is less parody as it is just a rare appearance, but come on, it's Robert Smith of The Cure. Going all the way back to the first season of the show, Smith appeared as himself to help the boys fight Barbara Streisand. We'll get to her later. Am I too late? Who are you? Dude, it's Robert Smith of The Cure. Whee! Here, you boys, hold this walkie. You can help me fight her. Transforming into a Mothra-like creature, he defeats her and even has Jesus call him their savior. Wow, Robert Smith is the greatest person that ever lived. Our savior. When asked about his appearance and portrayal years later, Smith was surprised by what he saw, but loved how Kyle gave huge props to The Cure's Disintegration album. Disintegration is the best album ever! Number 18, Brian Boitano. In the second Spirit of Christmas short, the boys can't decide whether to help Jesus or Santa. So when Stan asks, audiences are wondering why they'd ask for help from a figure skater. Now we've got to think here. Now let's see, what would Brian Boitano do? Yeah, what would Brian Boitano do? <laughs> Someone say my name. The same rang true in the South Park movie, but with a fantastic musical number that followed. What would Brian Boitano do if he was here right now? He'd make a plan and he'd follow through. That's what Brian Boitano do. Boitano himself saw the movie and worried about his portrayal, but came out loving what they had done. He's since worked with the creators to design t-shirts with the slogan and sell them for charity. On top of that, it introduced him to the likes of younger fans who now only know him through the show. Hi guys, Brian Boitano here. I just wanted to wish you a huge congratulations. I think your story is so incredible. Number 17, Paris Hilton. Near the end of season eight, South Park took aim at Paris Hilton and her status as a role model for the young girls in town. I'm pleased to be here in Gowthdark to announce the opening of my brand new store, a store where girls can buy everything they need to be just like me. It's hard to tell which part is more brutal, the video playset at the mall or her competition with Mr. Slave that ends the episode. Either way, there's no mistaking how savage the show's takedown is. Oh no, she didn't. When asked what she thought, she responded by saying she had never seen the episode, but thought anytime someone makes fun of you, it should be taken as a compliment. Given how she's tweeted about watching the show at home, we're guessing she's still a fan. It's adorable! Number 16, Terry Irwin. How long after someone passes away are you allowed to tell jokes about them? Oh, there's a king croc right there. He must be 4 meters, 12, 13 feet long at least. This croc has enough power in its jaws to rip my head right off. In the case of South Park, it's seven weeks. You know, the whole crocodile hunter thing, it, it's just a little soon, you know? I mean, he just died a few weeks ago and it's just not super cool. You gotta leave. But it's me, Satan, Steve Irwin. I am the crocodile hunter. Famed crocodile hunter Steve Irwin had been fatally injured in September of 2006. In late October of the same year, South Park aired an episode that featured him with a stingray sticking out of his chest. Terry Irwin, Steve's wife, was incredibly offended by the portrayal, citing concerns about how her children would feel if they saw it. She found support in her friend Mark Amy who suggested Irwin fans sick their dangerous pets on the creators of the show in protest. Hey, Satan, you got a little problem. What? Somebody showed up in a crocodile hunter costume. It's really offending some of the other guests. Oh, jeez. Number 15, Sarah Jessica Parker. 
One thing the creators of South Park have always stood by is their idea that anything and everything is fair game when it comes to comedy. No writer would take the time to make fun of Sarah Jessica Parker just because they think she's ugly. Yes, they would! So when female writers called them out for being mean about tearing into Sarah Jessica Parker over her looks, the two once again didn't hold back. The book is full of disgusting words and acts, including Sarah Jessica Parker, who is mentioned 465 times. Despite what anyone else thought, Parker herself never addressed the episode directly. Instead, in an interview with Stylist Magazine, she commented on how people seem to think being mean is funny. She went on to add that personal versus professional criticism was uncivilized and vulgar. Well, obviously I just think it's wrong to make fun of anybody's physical appearance. My wife is a beautiful woman and I know that most people agree with me. Number 14. Mama June Shannon Shows like Toddlers and Tiaras and Here Comes Honey Boo Boo have received all kinds of criticisms regarding the depictions of their stars. Her favorite foods are skeddy and butter, and she likes drinking Red Bull and Mountain Dew. The latter has been the subject of countless commentary about the family's diet and lifestyle choices over the course of its four seasons. Come on, come on now, Boo Boo. Now get up and wave to them judges. Given the type of language often used to describe the popular TLC program, there's a lot of irony in June Shannon's reaction to being satirized on South Park. During a TMZ appearance, she was asked what she thought of the parodies of her show. Taking some in stride, she wasn't a fan of how South Park took her on, saying, But just the way they portrayed the show, it was just, it was kind of trashy. Number 13, Bob Saget. As the original host of American's Funniest Home Videos, Bob Saget's quips were subtle and often bordered on some of the worst dad jokes out there. Yet, week after week, people would tune in to see what videos were coming next. Now these next clips are all about coincidence. Now suppose at the moment that I opened my mouth, from somewhere in the background you heard like a rooster crow. That would be coincidence, unless I worked on a poultry farm. Back in season one of South Park, Bob's gig as a host was parodied as Stan's grandfather watched America's stupidest home videos. Grandpa Marsh loved the jokes, but the boys found them incredibly lame. Knock, knock. Bob. Bob Saget. <laughs> During a Reddit AMA, Bob Saget was asked about his portrayal on South Park. He responded by saying he loved how Grandpa laughed at his jokes. Comparing it to relationships, he said the parody felt good and hurt all at the same time. I come out and I look like, you know, Beavis and Butthead meet Frankenstein. Number 12, Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart and her various shows have been depicted several times over the years on South Park. This is a nice raisin pudding right here. But we can also still eat our favorite foods. What we're going to do today is prepare a Thanksgiving turkey for Intro Retro. Her first appearance saw us learn about an unusual way to consume Thanksgiving Day turkey, whereas a season 13 appearance gave us one of the most creative ways to make use of paper and glitter crafts. Either way, much like Bob Saget, she also addressed her appearances on South Park during a Reddit AMA. Mrs. Stewart, we have some questions. Not right now, I just want to focus on my turkey right now. Her answer was quick and simple. I thought it was really cute. We're not sure if she saw both of these episodes, but we're guessing she thought they were a good thing. So now we're ready to go. Looks delicious. Let's try it out. Number 11, Sally Struthers. Sally Struthers may have got her start on All in the Family, but she went on to become a spokesperson for Child Fund, a charity focused on helping children in third world countries. Her commercials would often air on television, showing her amongst the kids. Hunger is an enemy that we all must fight. These children desperately need your support. South Park did their own story about children in Africa and featured an oversized Struthers who had been hoarding all of the donated food. Yes! Sally Struthers is holding food from us! Uh-oh. According to the Season 1 DVD commentary, Struthers was a big fan of the show, until this episode aired. 
It continues by saying she was so bothered by what she saw in the episode that she was emotionally distressed for days. People thought it was really mean to Sally Struthers, and apparently Sally Struthers was was a fan of South Park up until she saw this episode, and it really bummed her out, and what we heard is that she cried for, like, days. Number 10, Nick Jonas. To kick off season 13 of South Park, Kenny and his new girlfriend go off to see the Jonas Brothers in concert. Oh my god, it's that tingling again! The episode takes shots at the brothers by mentioning how they wear purity rings and are essentially servants to a maniacal Mickey Mouse. Well, well, maybe we'll just refuse to go on stage. Oof. During a 2016 Ask Me Anything, Nick Jonas admitted he wasn't a big fan of the episode when it originally came out. He said that he had so much going on when he was parodied that it was hard to find the humor in it. However, the episode has since grown on him. Bye -bye. He finds it funny and has watched it several times since. It's nice to see Nick Jonas being able to laugh at his younger self. Number 9. Caesar Milan In Season 10's tst episode, Cartman's mom hires Caesar Milan as a trainer to try and get Cartman in line. Mom, this is degrading! Ah, God damn it! <laughs> Don't look at him, just look straight ahead and he'll run out of energy soon. By treating him much like a dog, it doesn't take long for the celeb to make Cartman listen and behave. Oh, Eric, I'm very proud of you. Th thank you? I love you, sweetie. Okay, Mom, you're embarrassing me. Jeez. This entry is unique in that it's the only one on this list where the person being featured made their own YouTube reaction video for their episode. The clothes that I'm wearing is exactly what I used to wear. A, a blue, a, a, a navy blue uh, button down and a khaki pants. I think the first thing we need to work on is getting the child some exercise. He's fat and he has all this pent up energy that we need to let him burn off. Do you take walks with your son? Well, no, I don't. It, you know, and the part, the thing is, they also capture the the part where, as soon as I walk into the house, with dog, you know, with pet parents, uh, I go into action. For the better part of almost 20 minutes, Caesar breaks down the different things the show did and said. He's more than complimentary to the creators and shows a genuine love of what they do. Now that is how you react to being on South Park. They did an incredible job of like representing exactly, exactly what I, what I do. Number 8. Al Gore when season 10's Man Bear Pig episode aired, it was intended to poke fun at how frequently Al Gore wanted to talk about climate change. Man Bear Pig? It is a creature which roams the earth alone. It is half man, half bear, and half pig. Some people say that Man Bear Pig isn't real. Well, I'm here to tell you now, Man Bear Pig is very real, and he most certainly exists. I'm serial. The creators had no problem roasting how intense the politician got about his beliefs. Yet more than 10 years later, they'd changed their minds and made an in-episode apology to Gore. Real at all. During an appearance on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Gore was asked about what he thought of his portrayal. Not only did he think his original episode was funny, but he praised the show for later acknowledging how real Man Bear Pig turned out to be. It was great to see Gore take everything in stride and appreciate what the show had done. I thought it was a hell of a statement by South Park, and I appreciated it a lot. Number 7. Russell Crowe You walked right through my shot, mate! Do you know who I am? 
Oh, excuse me, I was just... <laughs> Never afraid to go after whomever was causing a stir in the real world, the folks at South Park took aim at Gladiator star Russell Crowe. He loves to act, but he loves one thing more, fight around the world. He's been in the news several times due to his aggressive behavior. The writers took this to the nth degree and devoted an entire storyline where they showed him as a person who just picks fights around the world. Why, oh, you want a fight, huh? Think you can take me, you little buggers? Oh. When Crow appeared on 60 Minutes, he was asked about his portrayal on the show. He was quick to compliment Parker and Stone for their work. Crow also admitted that seeing himself in such an exaggerated manner actually got him to reflect on his own life. For me, a lot of it's, you know, if there was something to, for me to learn from it, is um, the analogous thing, you know, because I did think the whole thing was a fight. I did think my whole career was a struggle. You know? Judging from his statements, it seems as though seeing his depiction on South Park may have actually been therapeutic for the actor. Number 6. George R. R. Martin It's the Red Wedding, isn't it? You hate how I killed everyone off! Uh, no sir, we just really need to know about the dragons, but they never seem to show up. Oh, they're coming. The dragons are on their way. When? You really want to know? South Park once opted to do a three-part episode devoted to HBO's Game of Thrones. The epic comedy is set in and around Black Friday. During the story, the boys fight each other over access to the two new game consoles coming out that weekend. Part of the way through, George R. R. Martin, the author of the books which inspired Game of Thrones, appears. He tries to help the boys with dragon knowledge, but keeps talking about one particular part of human anatomy. Stop, please! I can't take any more! But this is the best part! Right before King Joffrey gets poisoned, everyone flops their wieners all around his face. Yeah! Listen, buddy, you promised that peaches were on the way. If they don't show up right now, you're gonna have a dead kid on your hands. Do you hear me? Okay, okay, fine, fine. What kind of peaches do you want? What kind do we want? He hasn't even ordered your pizzas yet! Don't worry, they're coming! Not just two pizzas, there's, there's gonna be five. And they're gonna be huge, you won't believe it! The real Martin is a fan of the show and largely likes his South Park portrayal but he did have a hilarious and not exactly safe for work response indicating that he's actually obsessed with another physical feature of human beings. And anyone who knows me or has watched my show knows that my actual obsession is with boobies. <laughs> No matter how many times we talk about Randy Marsh's Lord, it still makes us laugh. Lord, we're all big fans of your music, and we thank the world of you for staying and working here even after your music career took off. Well, my music and fluvial geomorphology are intertwined. But knowing what the singer herself thinks about it makes the plotline even better. At the start of season 18, we get a glimpse of Randy Marsh dressed up as Lord singing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord, Lord, come in, Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. This turns into a story later on where we find out he's the real singer and is struggling to maintain his dual identities. My girls are big fans of your music, Lord. During an interview and on her own social media outlets, Lord gave praise for the show's portrayal of her. She even went as far as to do an impression of Randy doing his impression of her. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lord's meta compliment is a huge sign of her approval. Number four, Barbara Streisand. Way back during the first season of South Park, the show decided to take aim at Barbara Streisand. I'm going ah, stop where that. there's lucky clovers yeah, in that the. Yeah, sucks, dude. I'm Barbara Streisand. So? So? Well, so I'm a very famous and very important individual. Like John Elway important? What? Do you know John Elway? No. Oh, so you're really famous and important, but you don't know John Elway. The show's creators, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, chose her mainly out of her distaste for their home state of Colorado, which she had swore to never return to. After being portrayed in the episode Mecha Streisand, the singer responded with a fairly serious answer. Mayor, Barbara Streisand is- I noticed! Call the National Guard! 
Instead of simply taking the jab with a grain of salt, she called out their particular brand of satire. Streisand claimed shows like South Park add cynicism and negativity in our culture, especially in children. Stone and Parker clearly didn't take her comments too much to heart because they continued to make fun of her. There she is, Tom! Barbara Streisand! My god, she's even more terrifying than I remembered. Number 3. Jennifer Lopez When 2003 rolled around and J-Lo made her first appearance on South Park, the singer-slash-actress wasn't exactly a fan. But you don't have to ask me. You can ask my special guest, Miss Jennifer Lopez. What? Jennifer Lopez? No way. Miss Lopez, come on out here. Hello? Oh, Jesus Christ. My name is Jennifer Lopez. I eat tacos y burritos. Miss Lopez, would you like to talk about Latinos in the arts? Oh, si, sí, si. Sí. But first, I would like to put on my pretty dress. Oh, you mean this one? Oh, si, si, si. I like it very much. There we go. It's all right? It's all right. That's a very pretty dress. It better be. I am Jennifer Lopez. No, no, no. You're Jennifer Lopez. Si, si. Jennifer Lopez. No, no. Je. Huh? Je. Huh? Je. Je. Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez. Even prior to the episode's airing, it appeared that South Park co-creator Trey Parker had already gotten on her bad side after infamously wearing her dress to the 2000 Oscars. After Season 7's Fat Butt and Pancake Head came along, the bad blood she had for the show and its creators seemed to intensify. That? That's what replaced me? Parker and Stone had even heard that people were allegedly fired from the set of a J.Lo movie after repeating lines from the episode around her. We wouldn't recommend mentioning the show at all if you're ever around the pop star. Number 2. Kanye West Do you like fish dicks? Love them! You're a gay fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not! Ah! Do you like fish sticks? Well, apparently, Kanye West doesn't. You really don't get it. Hey man, I'm a genius, alright? I'm the most talented musician in the world! During a season 13 episode, Cartman and Jimmy come up with a silly joke about fish sticks that serves as a double entendre. Although everyone on Earth is laughing at the joke, the only one who doesn't get it is Kanye West. No, because you said you like fish sticks, Kanye. Don't, don't you get it? Things went slightly differently in the real world when West responded to his portrayal with an all-caps post. During the post, he claimed he was working on some of the negative aspects of his personality and talked about the nature of celebrity. But West also complimented the show's creators and admitted to finding the show funny. It was weirdly inspiring to see the musician rolling with the punches. However, a lyric from his song, Gorgeous, may have indicated that he was still feeling bitter about the whole ordeal. We make him say, oh, cause the game's so pimpish. Choke a South Park writer with a fish stick. Number one, Tom Cruise. Elron! It really is you! Oh, this is the greatest day of my life. Ah, uh, dude, I need to go to bed. Don't you understand, Elron? It's me, Tom Cruise! Yeah, I know who you are. South Park has made itself known as being willing to go after anyone, regardless of who they are. One of the most well-known reactions to an episode of the show came after Season 9's Trapped in the Closet episode. The story poked fun at both Scientology and Tom Cruise. Tom, don't you think this has gone on long enough? It's time for you to come out of the closet. I'm not, I'm not in the closet. Yes, you are, Tom. And you need to just end this and come out. I'm not going to think any differently of you. Katie's not going to think any differently of you. You don't need to be in that closet anymore, Tom. I'm not in here, though. Yes, you are. I'm not... I'm not in the closet. Rumor has it that the actor was so offended by the episode that he threatened to pull his Mission Impossible 3 press tour unless the network agreed not to rerun the episode in question. So trust me. Just don't. Whether or not Cruz actually made this threat was irrelevant because the original re-airing was pulled. It did make the air again eventually without issue, long after the heat of the actor controversy cooled down. So you're not the prophet, huh? You made me look stupid. I'm gonna sue you too. Well fine, go ahead and sue me. I will. I'll sue you in England. You are so sued, kid. Well go on then, sue me. We're going to. Okay, good. Do it. 
I'm not scared of you. Sue me. The TV crossover. Yes, it's a bit of a lost art in my opinion, but it was always fun to see characters from one TV show appear on another TV show. And as you may have guessed, well, South Park has had its fair share of times where its characters have infiltrated other TV shows. Take a look. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 times South Park infiltrated other shows. Who do you think? The cartoon that's always pushing buttons with their careless toilet humor. Family Guy! For this list, we'll be looking at other television programs that included either references or direct appearances from characters in this mountain town comedy. Did we miss a notable South Park nod somewhere? Number 10, Boy Meets World. As a show about a young man passing into adulthood, they occasionally dove into the realm of serious topics, but by far and large kept the material light. One notable example was from season five where the show poked fun at countless horror films. As the door opens, Eric acknowledges the group with a very familiar Mr. Hanky greeting. <laughs> <laughs> Later in the same scene as one of the other friends is seemingly hurt, he then shouts out yet another catchphrase from South Park's early years. Oh my gosh! They killed Kenny! <laughs> Funnily enough, in a handful of other episodes, Eric does his own Cartman impression as well. Maybe it's the name that brings it out. Howdy ho! Howdy ho, Carl! Number 9, Robot Chicken. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that South Park found its way into Robot Chicken. Finally, the chef, whose cuisine and character is a little two-dimensional, Thetans, aka the souls of dead aliens. <laughs> well known for its satirical content, this time we find Chef participating in Gordon Ramsay's Master Chef Celebrity Showdown. His dessert of choice is a Thetan, aka Spirits of the Dead, lava cake, which was an obvious dig at Isaac Hayes' history as a Scientologist. And just as it always does on South Park, chaos ensues as the Thetans get loose and terrorize the kitchen. It's a bit more of a parody than an infiltration into the show, but still a fantastic nod to its cast. The winner is Scientology! <laughs> Number 8, 19th Cable Ace Awards. During the first few years of the show's run, South Park found itself popping up on countless award shows. You young whippersnappers who so desperately seek to join our ranks. They did a skit for the MTV Movie Awards in 2000 and even poked fun at the American Comedy Awards in 1998. One of their first appearances was as presenters for the 1997 Cable Ace Awards. The four boys came out on stage to present the nominations for Best Talk Show Series. Tonight, we are here to present the award for Best Talk Show Series. Hey! Wait a minute! Between Cartman's complaints about it being all fancy and Stan having to translate for Kenny when he announces the winner, it's a cute bit that many fans today may not have even seen. That sucks! Who's in charge here? Anyway, the nominees for Best Talk Show Series are... No! Everybody just hold on a minute! Number 7, The Powerpuff Girls. Ask any parent of a kindergarten age child and they can probably cite a handful of TV shows their kids are obsessed with. Sugar, Spice, and Everything Nice. Among them, The Powerpuff Girls is the last place you would ever expect to see a reference to South Park. Nonetheless, for any adults watching the Imaginary Friend episode, they spot and hear something familiar. Blossom crashes into a pile of laundry, and when she emerges, she's wearing a red sweater and a blue hat with a little pom-pom on it. She also uses the word seriously. Blossom, are you okay? Uh, you trip me. Seriously. Cartman is the last thing you'd expect to see in this kind of show, but clearly the creators are fans. No way. I don't believe it. I'm seriously, you guys. Come on, watch. Number six, Celebrity Deathmatch. The odds of ever getting some of Hollywood's biggest stars in a boxing ring to slug it out are slim to none. Which beautiful head will roll when two teenage temptresses tear each other apart? Which malicious musician will live to play another note? But it became a whole lot more possible when MTV put together the claimated stop-motion show, Celebrity Deathmatch. During this round, bass player Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers takes on Kenny G. If this goes where I think it's going, Kenny G may never play sax again. Between playing the sax and a swarm of bugs, Flea eventually takes him out. It's here a wink to South Park appears as the hosts paraphrase one of the show's most notable catchphrases. Oh my god, Flea killed Kenny G! It goes further when an audience member looking an awful lot like Kenny McCormick chimes in as well. You bastard! Number five, The Office. Who doesn't love a good Halloween episode? Sweet Stoom, dude. Where are you supposed to be? Dave. Cool. Almost every sitcom has given a take on this spooky holiday. The Office did a total of six Halloween-themed episodes and found a way to sneak Chef from South Park into the mix. I'm gonna make love to you, woman. Gonna lay you down by the fire. In season eight, Andy is pre-approving the costumes for the party and Stanley comes in with a chef's outfit. 
In a quick blink and you'll miss it moment, Andy exclaims, Chef from South Park, it's genius. Stanley claims it's not a reference to the soul singing cafeteria cook, but we can't help but notice the resemblance once he gets into costume. Number 4. Family Guy among diehard South Park fans, it's well established that the creators are not fans of Family Guy. Family Guy is written by manatees? Of course, it all makes sense now. This was made clear by the Cartoon Wars two-parter back in Season 10. Despite this, however, it seems Seth MacFarlane must still enjoy the small mountain town. Oh, I always wanted to go to Canada, but then South Park went so we couldn't go. References have been made in episodes on more than one occasion. Peter comes right out and mentions the ribbing they got from South Park in one monologue. Family Guy has survived 19 cancellations, two assassination attempts, and a pretty good ribbon by those South Park guys. A dead Kenny appeared in the intro for one of their episodes. They even acknowledged the show's accolades in their Emmy-winning episode, highlighting how South Park and others had won Emmys when they had not. Despite any differences, clearly, there's some respect from the Griffin side. Number 3. Last Man Standing Even multi-camera sitcoms can't help but tip their hat to the folks over at South Park. In a Season 2 episode of Last Man Standing, Eve hides all of the makeup in the house, putting Mandy into a panic. Okay, Dad, don't freak out until we have all the facts, but something horrible has happened. Oh, all right, calm down. Oh, what is it? One at a time. Apparently, Eve has hidden all of the makeup in the house. When he next sees her, she's clearly doing her best Kenny McCormick impression. Dressed in an orange hoodie and sunglasses, the only thing that distinguishes her from the original is her legible voice. Can you help me out? I just need a, I need a little bit of eyeliner, just a couple of lines. <laughs> Desperately seeking anyone to borrow makeup from, the bell rings and the hall is filled with kids, one of whom identifies her as Kenny himself. Oh my god, look everyone! It's Kenny from South Park! <laughs> we knew the joke was coming, but that didn't make it any less funny. Number 2. Mad TV. Where do we even begin? This Mad TV parody used characters from the Peanuts gang and animated them in a similar fashion to South Park. Schloder, did you know that God has selected me to lead all of South Park nuts to the gates of heaven? You can be my acolyte. Over the course of four minutes, we are treated to gag after gag referencing countless bits from the first season of the Mountain Town show. It starts with an almost word-for-word -word rip on a now famous conversation between Kyle and Cartman. Charlie Frown, you're a blockhead. Yeah, well, you're a filthy f I am not. From there, we get a version of Chef, the death and famous tagline of one character, the blood and gore of earlier episodes, all the way to an ending with Snoopy playing the part of Mr. Hanky. Hardy ho! It's one of the single best parodies of South Park ever put to screen. Number 1. The Simpsons Having originated as far back as 1987, The Simpsons helped shows like South Park and others become a reality. I hear those kids' voices are done by grown-ups. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. I just wonder how they keep it so fresh after 43 episodes. And even though many of these newer programs may seem like competitors, a natural respect for each other seems to have formed. On more than one occasion, The Simpsons have found clever ways to appreciate the folks over at South Park. Oh my god, I killed Kenny! From Bart and his friends dressed as Stan, Kyle and the others to catching a glimpse of the Mountain Town characters on Homer's TV, there's no shortage of homages in this show. It's a TV show or did I walk into a third grade shoebox diorama? Did you steal my painting? Even Homer once ended up in front of the school being cussed out by four young boys. That's a lot of friendly banter which makes this a perfect number one. Dude, the Simpsons done everything already, who cares? Yeah, they've been on the air for like 13 years, of course they've done everything. Oh my god, they killed Kenny! Again, and again, and again. Yes, killing poor Kenny has become one of television's greatest running gags. And to end things today, well, we're going to take a look at our favorite times, Kenny bit the dust. Oh my god! They killed Kenny! You bastard! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 Kenny deaths in South Park. Goodbye, you guys. For this list, we'll be looking at the countless ways our favorite hoodie-wearing resident has bought the farm over the many seasons of this show. What's your favorite Kenny death? Number 20. Buy Turkeys In the early years of South Park, having Kenny die in every episode was simply part of the show's mythos. Come on, Kenny! Come on, son! With the creators having long abandoned that running gag years ago, it's interesting to go back and see the creative ways they took Kenny from us. In a mid-season one episode, the town is being overrun by mutated turkeys created by Dr. Mephesto. And the worst part is, they're really pissed off. In a send-up of the movie Braveheart, we get the famous William Wallace speech from both Chef and the turkeys themselves. But poor Kenny never stood a chance. Before he can fight himself, he's mauled by a group of raging turkeys. 
Worst Thanksgiving Ever. <laughs> Number 19. Buy PSP and Ice Cream Truck. Given how much Cartman loves to torture Kenny about being poor, we love how the season 9 episode Best Friends Forever gave Kenny a break. Our favorite orange hoodie wearing South Park resident is the first in line to acquire the new PlayStation Portable gaming console. Dude, you see what Kenny got? Yes, yes, I know. Up yours, Kyle. Although he beats Cartman to the punch, it comes with a bit of a heavy price tag. After finally making it to level 60 on his game, Kenny is crushed by an ice cream truck. The twist, however, is it's only the beginning of his adventure. His PSP skills are put to work in the afterlife as he battles to save all humankind. Yes, good Kenny! The Angel Spearmen are taking out their demon soul rippers! Oh, the Calvary Angels are clashing with their Black Knights! It's a great death, followed by a great afterlife. Number 18. By Brown Note. The Brown Note is a theory that a particular sound can trigger the involuntary loss of bowel control within an individual. It's been around for ages, but has widely been debunked, particularly on an episode of Mythbusters. In a late Season 3 episode, Cartman claims he has found the infamous note, and the boys hatch a plan to unleash it at a worldwide recorder concert they are participating in. No way. I don't believe it. I'm seriously, you guys. Come on, watch. Okay. Oh, oh my god! Their prank works, and the world is left in an awful mess. Kenny, however, apparently didn't have the constitution to survive such a blast. We last see him in a field having died from the incident. Alan, I'm standing at ground zero. Here, the damage is greater than anywhere. Like the rest of the world, everyone here has crapped their pants. Some crapped themselves to death. It's hilarious, despite the fact the death occurs off screen. Number 17. By Giant Bird. It's not too often that Kenny's death is foreshadowed by the story. You will follow the agnostic code. We cannot know with certainty if God or Christ exists. They could. Then again, there could be a giant reptilian bird in charge of everything. Can we be certain there isn't? No, so it's pointless to talk about. In the last episode of season 15, Kenny and his siblings are taken away from their parents and put in the foster system. Their new caretakers posit the possibility that God is a giant bird, which of course sets the stage for Kenny's death. Shortly after returning to school, a massive avian creature smashes through the roof and eats Kenny. We love the idea that something so random was introduced early in the episode, just to give us a great payoff in the end. Ah, uh, my mama's so poor she walks down the road with one shoe. <laughs> and if you ask her if she lost a shoe, she says, no, I found one. Number 16. By Microwave. Until the recent COVID episodes, Dr. Mephisto had been largely absent from most of the show's later episodes. He made his first appearance in Season 1 when Kyle wanted to crossbreed his elephant with a pig. When that can't happen, Mephisto steals Stan's blood and makes a not-so-perfect clone that becomes Kenny's downfall. As Stan's mutant clone rampages through the house, Kenny is accidentally thrown into a microwave, which of course turns on and nukes the poor kid. It's a far less gruesome death than some of the others on this list, but still highly entertaining. Oh my god! They killed Kenny! You bastard! Number 15. By Laughter. You've heard of the saying, dying of laughter. <laughs> this was an instance where that came true for Kenny McCormick. After being picked on by Scott Tennerman, Carmen goes to extreme lengths to get back at him. During the ping-ponging back and forth, Scott gets a good one on Eric when he shows the town a video of Cartman making literal pig noises. It's here we lose Kenny in a fit of uncontrollable laughter. To actually off a character using an old adage like this is incredibly clever and well played out. Plus, at least he got to see Eric embarrass himself. Number 14. By Sniper Rifle and Flagpole. With only one episode under their belt, audiences hadn't yet learned that Kenny was going to die every week. Viewers who had caught the premiere may have been surprised to see him return unscathed. The pattern of Kenny's deaths would be set in motion by the worst bad luck imaginable. An oversized Cartman breaks the stage, sending a glass-covered Kathy Lee Gifford into orbit. 
Garrison's assassination attempt goes awry, hitting Kenny instead. The gunshot alone doesn't make this all that memorable, but having Kenny blasted into the air and fallen down a flagpole, that's worthy of an entry on our list. Here it is, my big moment of fame. Number 13, by Bebe. Similar to our previous entry, this one too involves Kenny dying from a gunshot. It too was accidental, but in all the best ways. Bebe pulls a gun on Wendy in an attempt to keep the details about a special girl's list a secret. Give me that list, Wendy. Scan, what is going on? It was about shoes, Kyle. The girls wanted shoes, so they set you up. Much like countless movies, the two end up in a fight and the gun goes off, and we're left wondering who's about to buy it. Unlike what we usually see, neither of them is harmed, and both are completely confused. That is, until it cuts to Kenny taking a shot through the head while eating his cereal. The sheer randomness of this one is what makes it so memorable. Can't the guy get a break and enjoy his breakfast for dinner? Wait, I, I didn't do anything wrong! Number 12. By Death. Stan's grandpa is celebrating his 102nd birthday, and all he wants is to rest in peace. How's it feel to be 102, Paps? Shoot me! The running joke is that grandpa wants to die, and is trying anything and everything to accomplish that. So when death itself shows up, audiences think old man Marsh will finally get his wish. Not so quick. Upset that Terrence and Philip are off the air, death touches Kenny, and it's all over. We thoroughly enjoyed how the episode addresses the topic of death and teases the audience the whole time. You think it's coming for Grandpa when Kenny was his target all along. Hey! You were supposed to kill me! Number 11. Death by UFO The pilot episode of South Park spent a lot more time on Kenny's death than many of the subsequent outings. Give me back my brother! A UFO shoots him, then he's attacked by cows and finally run over by a cop car. Even then, the boys have to tear his body apart to prove to Cartman it's not all some joke. This death is noteworthy simply because it was the first. Or was it? Actually, the Kenny we know and love was first killed off in the infamous Spirit of Christmas short that preceded the TV show. Either way, it was a first for mass audiences and still a memorable death. Ah, uh, man, I had this crazy nightmare last night. Number 10, By Monkey. If you grew up in the late 80s and early 90s, you undoubtedly saw the commercials for Hooked on Phonics. It was a unique way to teach reading skills. Carmen's mom gets him hooked on monkey phonics to help him learn how to spell. This set comes with a live monkey that plays the drums to help you. The learning monkey is here to say that reading is easy and it's okay. Cartman's spelling may have not gotten any better, but the monkey certainly did teach Kenny a lesson. He attacks the kid, throwing him repeatedly around Cartman's room until eventually he's left a bloody mess. <laughs> It's not often we get to see Kenny take a beating from an animal, but this one is certainly hilarious. Dude, what a bunch of freaking nerdos. Number 9. By Syphilis. Kenny finally gets himself a girlfriend. Her name's Tammy Warner. She's the only girl in school whose family is actually poorer than Kenny's. It's really kind of beautiful if you ask me. So when he finds out she has a reputation with another boy in the school, he's ironically overjoyed by the prospect of what being with Tammy means. The episode volleys back and forth around the subject of young people being sexually active. It's here where we find our friend Kenny losing his life. Unlike many of the other entries on this list, we don't actually see him die. Instead, we're given his funeral where the perils of STIs are made very clear. Let us all be reminded that syphilis is still a deadly disease, and it can be caught even if using protection. It's a death that is far more subtle on screen, but riddled with plenty of subtext. Number 8. By Space Station Unlike most episodes, this one gave us a Kenny death within the first few minutes. For South Park's first Halloween episode, the boys are at the bus stop as per usual. Unbeknownst to them, the space station Mir has malfunctioned and is crashing towards the Earth. 
And yes, it of course lands on Kenny, killing him. What the hell is that thing? It looks like a UFO! But it's not just that death that makes this memorable. He becomes the first of many zombies within the town after being embalmed with Worcestershire sauce. It's not until Kyle saws him in half the terror ends. It's a rarity to get two great deaths in one episode. Dude, you're the one who cut him in half with a chainsaw. L let us remember the good times. Kenny would have wanted it. <laughs> Number 7. By Giant Fan. It's not the Island of Misfit Toys. Who lives in the east neath the willow tree? Sexual harassment, panda. No, it's the Island of Misfit mascots commune. A commune indeed, as we find it filled with countless rejected costumed individuals. And it's there we meet Jimmy the don't hold on to a large magnet while someone else uses a fan nearby Falcon. Cue the giant fan and Kenny holding on to a magnet. And we're pretty sure you can figure out what happens next. <laughs> we love the nod to the classic Rudolph story while still finding obscure ways to kill off Kenny. Who even has a fan that size? Number 6. Buy Antacid Tablets Ever drop an Antacid tablet in water? It produces quite a bit of fizz. Although not to the extremes of Diet Coke and Mentos. In a conference room at Kyle's dad's office, Kenny mistakes a bowl of antacid pills for candy mints. After having consumed all 60 of them, he needs a drink. Yeah, you can have a drink of water. The dispenser's over there. Yeah, you must be thirsty after eating 60 mints. One glass of water later, and we're treated to an explosion of Tums proportions. It's the innocence of this one that we love. Kenny is just hungry and wants a sweet little treat. Thankfully, as always, he returns to his old self one episode later. Number 5. By Asphyxiation The start of Season 12 saw the show take aim at infidelity scandals among celebrities. As you've all seen on the news, our country is facing a major crisis. This included Tiger Woods, who was going through a very public rough patch in his marriage at the time. Sexual addiction is blamed as the cause of all the problems. A ridiculous test sees several of the boys, including Kenny, as being afflicted. It's clearly a misdiagnosis, but that doesn't stop Kenny from ultimately succumbing to what the doctor says is the final result of the disease. We can't help but laugh at the end result, but also cringe thinking of how our hero Mysterion would be found. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. Number 4. By Tampon In Season 3, Carmen catches a stomach virus that causes bleeding in the colon. Yesterday, I got my period. You got your what? He mistakenly thinks it's menstruating and has now hit puberty. Kenny soon catches it as well and joins Cartman in buying supplies to help with their newfound entrance into adulthood. Given the choices people who menstruate usually have, Cartman uses a liner, while Kenny uses something else. Here is where Kenny's naivety gives us comedic gold. The audience knows he's most definitely made a mistake, and at some point, it's going to pay out. Okay, is everyone accounted for? Goddess Wind? Here! Goddess Moon? Goddess Moon! In Eric's clubhouse, the worst happens, and Kenny's stomach discomfort becomes fatal. It's nowhere near as explicit as some of his other deaths, but that doesn't make it any less funny. Number 3. By Ozzy Osbourne Even if you're not a fan, you've undoubtedly heard at least a peripheral version of the Ozzy and the Bat story. Someone threw a real bat on stage, Ozzy thought it was fake, and bit the head off. I remember when I was just starting out, Chef suggested I buy a pompadour hat. I thought he said, bite the head of a bat. So I did. It's one of the most legendary tales in rock music history. So, when Chef needs help from all his former music pals, Ozzy of course plays Chef Aid, and we get a South Park version of that tale. The animated version grabs Kenny from the crowd and bites his head clean off. It's a fantastic nod to the original story, especially since Ozzy himself made a guest appearance on the show and the album of the same name. We're all here to help our good friend Chef, who has touched our lives in the past. Number 2. By Seizure 
right in the middle of the Pokemon craze, South Park decided to do their own version of it with Chin Pokemon. Someday I will collect all the Chin Pokemon, then I will fight the evil power that will reveal itself once all the Chin Pokemon are collected. Oh. Much like little kids in the real world, everyone in town is obsessed with all things related to the Japanese characters. While playing the new video game, Kenny becomes so entrenched that he falls into a seizure and remains that way for much of the episode. The long, blank gaze he keeps giving everyone is both funny and creepy. But eventually, it's too much, and he merely explodes with rats eating him from the inside out. It's a long play to a burst of death, but certainly notable. Ew, this game rude. Number 1. By Spontaneous Combustion Picture it. You're out for a nice walk with your friends. A quick little banter back and forth, and poof! Your friend blips into a pile of embers like they were never there. Good night, Jerry. <laughs> See you, Tom. Bye, Helen. Bye, Jerry. <laughs> no, it's not a magic trick, and they haven't been snapped by Thanos. It's spontaneous combustion. Kenny ends up being the first of many in the town to instantly burst into nothing but ash with no warning. Oh, where are you gonna go, Kenny? You gonna see your little girlfriend again? <laughs> Dude, you spend way too much time with that girl. If you <laughs> Not only is it the fastest way Kenny ever goes, but the cause of it is similar to what killed him in the movie. Turns out, there really are no diminished returns on fart jokes. All right, well, that's going to do it for this very special deep dive into the wonderful world of South Park. May the show never fail to offend. Thanks for watching. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo, and I'll see you next time.